Okay, I'm going to start with an explanation of the burner system that we have here. And then we'll go into some of the maintenance and then uh, break it down a little further into the full setup as it's assembled and how to fire it and how it works. So you have to pardon the uh, sun is coming right in here at that camera, so it's a little hard to see. But this is a standard Beckett burner. It's uh, found in a whole bunch of uh, oil-fired systems. You can really even fire, find these in the old fuel oil furnaces. You can find them in some of the current waste oil burners that you buy uh, as a full assembly on the market. Pretty standard. Um, whether or not they'll have this long boot, uh, blast tube or short blast tube, all depends on the application. This particular longer blast tube, and this comes into play in the different models, was actually part of another unit that I used here in order to get me the length to go into my uh, furnace. Uh, and that'll explain that a little later as well. But this length here can be any length, truly, but some units will require the longer blast tube. And if you were to buy this kit from that ckburners.com, which I am not affiliated with and not sponsored by, it's just where this, some of these kit pieces came from, how long this tube is will matter. Also, I believe they sell the different lengths. But getting into the explanation of the unit, the parts that were not in the other video that are hopefully seen in this video is, first of all, the burner head. Uh, normally, they will not have this, or they'll have a slightly different variant of it. This kit comes with this air diffuser right here that basically is helping the air that is being pushed up to the nozzle. It makes it so it can, it can blast around it in a little bit better scenario. Uh, it basically kind of creates like a centrifugal uh, air distribution around the flame. So if you can see how these fins are uh, bent here, those fins are, are allowing for the air to create a vortex, if you will. Of course, here's the head, the burner head, and behind it is a block. I'll try to see if I have some still pictures to put in the video, but behind that's the block that you also buy from CK Burners, or some people have produced themselves. Um, that is what is preheating the oil right at the nozzle. So you've got the nozzle itself, which is right here, that has... Um, a kind of a Venturi style uh, head to it, or I'm sorry, a nozzle in it, which is aerating the oil and then shooting out in a real fine mist. Behind that, if you can see the aluminum block, that's what heats it, has the temperature probe. Of course, these are your electrodes uh, right here. Your electrodes obviously are, are arcing amongst each other and that's what lights your mixture on fire. <clears throat> and then it will blast out from here and generally it'll be roughly this big anything from a short 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 flame to pretty deep you know maybe 12 inches or more depends on you depends on how you have it adjusted and i'll also get into that mine is adjustable i have it set up so that i can dictate that flames uh, length whereas if you buy a if you buy this and set it up as a normal unit it is a set output it's set to you know half a gallon an hour gallon an hour, gallon and a half an hour, whatever. And that all dictates that flame length. I'm accomplishing my own flame right here on this valve. And again, we will explain more of this once this unit's back inside of the, the burner. But as a quick synopsis, the oil is coming in here. There's a pre-filter here. This is your standard Beckett pump. This is pressurizing the oil. And under a normal case and scenario, that would come up to here and pressurize the oil into the nozzle that the existing Beckett burner would come with, which would not have anything except just a nozzle thing. It wouldn't have all this preheater stuff. It wouldn't have an air injection, none of that in a standard format. But in this, this one, it's coming in down here, going to this little small screen, pressurized, coming out here. And in my scenario, I have it going to a T where I can siphon off whatever amount I wish to here to, to head up to my nozzle. The remaining will return back to my 
holding tank or my preheat tank and then start the loop all over again, come back into here and continuously loop. And I will get into all of that as well once everything's assembled. But this ball valve is really the key to your flame's intensity. Uh, to furthermore show on here what will be a little bit more difficult to show once this is back in the unit. Again, I apologize for the sun there. Is right here is your air inlet, your air coming in. And that would come in where in the old Beckett Burner's fuel oil spot. It's now air. That's coming into the blast tube. I really can't see a whole lot, but there's not much to show you. And that comes to the nozzle head that's right here. And of course, the oil is coming down from this bottom side, so they're joining together inside your head here. The uh, heated block that you receive. And then injecting and coming out. Uh, the other couple things to note on this system is pretty, again, pretty simple. This is an air solenoid, which we are not using. It's just there to keep the the whole block right now. Uh, I would recommend this air solenoid if you are going to run um, a thermostatically controlled unit. In other words, if you want this to turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off at the demand of your building, you would want to keep this air solenoid in place because this will shut down any air when it's off and return air when it's on. Also, if there's a fail-safe issue, something happens, the flame goes out, whatever occurs, that shuts the air down and doesn't allow any air to continue to pump into the system. Uh, mine, again, is a lot more manual because I am here all the time, and um, I only fire this when I'm in its presence, so um, I have it bypassed. Uh, and also, again, in my scenario, I have an uninsulated building, so um, I run this quite a lot when I do need it, if it's cold. And this solenoid gets a little hot running constantly. Uh, the last thing to show, I believe the last couple of quick things to show is just over here. And again, I apologize for the mess. All the wires are out because I'm just doing maintenance to it. It's normally much tidier. And then if you do your own install, I'm sure that's how it'll look. <laughs> right here is, uh, this is the uh, relay that is controlled by your uh, uh, temperature box. It's it Basically, it's, it's got a probe in it and everything, but the, the temperature box does. This right here is the relay that would send power to your heating unit um, inside the, the uh, block here. So that feeds the, that is the relay that feeds the power to the thermal coupler, or I'm sorry, not the thermal coupler, the actual heating element that's in here that has a thermal coupler that goes back to a, a sensor block that this is being run by. And I, again, we'll explain all of that once we move to the uh, unit assembled back inside of the heater. One uh, other thing to note, this area right here is what dictates the amount of air that comes into your squirrel cage, which is then forced into your air tube. This is not compressed air. This is just general burnable combustion air that is assisting the flame and going into the air box. Your needs will vary by your setup. If you have a really large fire firebox and you're burning a large flame, you'll want more air. If you have a smaller firebox, smaller flame, you have less. In my particular case, because of the, my full adjustability of the flame here and I run a little bit more compressed air, I actually have this pretty well blocked off. So we obviously do get some airflow through here, but it's pretty minor. Um, just a quick tour back around the unit again. Apologize for the, the sunlight. It's kind of bright. Just in general, what it looks like. Yours will be similar but you uh, could certainly have a whole lot of other different styles. Beckett's just really, really common. There is his Larry, Ohio. Uh, and there's your model for this particular one. The AFG, pretty common. Um, but there are diff there are many variances of this. There's ones that have a lot of smaller transformers. This is just an older one, which I used. They have a lot smaller motors that run everything uh, more efficient, which is great. Uh, and that pretty well wraps it up. I think I will show you just here. This is something I added. It's got quite a bit of goofy silicone. But where the oil comes in, I did have an issue where uh, after a long burn time, maybe hours and hours of burning, you do get some oil that doesn't fully, fully burn and maybe sprays and drips down into this tube. Well, some of that can find its way back. And if this isn't sealed, it will leak out into the front of your heater. Now it would take hours for that to occur and it would be very minor what would come through. 
Um, and again, mine is burning solid. So if I'm here eight hours, if it's cold, this thing runs eight hours solid. Uh, it's not cycling because again, uninsulated building. Um, but it's plenty of, plenty of heat. I just am choosing to restrict or increase my oil flow to ump, to up my BTUs, my work, my heat that's being produced or drop it based on my needs instead of cycling in on and off. It works out better because it just, um, again, on those cold days, if I decided to turn this heater on, uh, it works out better in my case. So I believe that that shows everything right now. Um, I'll walk you over to the unit real quick and we will pick up the video once I get some things back together. This is the head out of the unit. This is the whole unit here. We'll explain this more again in a bit. What we're gonna end up doing is cleaning out inside of that fire area, that fire box. And we'll be cleaning up down here, putting this all back together and explaining what all this does. Okay, gonna interject a little bit into the video here. The center, I get a lot of questions on what's going on inside the burner. I actually had not intended to pull this apart, but we had a slight issue with one of the uh, igniter probes. So I figured this would be a great opportunity to, to break it down and show you. Now, this is a little crude what I got going on here, but uh, it works. Um, normally you would have some really nice uh, metal ties. Um, maybe even do this a slight bit more cleaner. But you got to understand the reason I have it like this is because mine's totally manual. I do pull this out once a year. I clean it. Um, I have a broken piece on, on this igniter uh, right here. Uh, typically, this is supposed to be mounted down. I have another one of these heads that I'm going to put in, but um, for now, and for test purposes, this is what we have. This unit right here, this is the, the uh, CK Burners block that you buy. Again, others have made their own, or I believe there is some other uh, companies selling it. It has a the, the heating element that comes in the backside here, and then the, the uh, thermal coupler that comes in right here that sends the temperature. And then this is actually where the mixing occurs between here and the, and the nozzle head, and then it sprays. This also demonstrates a little bit how you can see this. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to hold the camera in this, but this top pipe right here coming in is where your oil, I'm sorry, your air pressure is coming to the nozzle. So that's coming, set this down to show you. That's coming from here, right here, down in. That is actually the original Beckett unit. This is where the oil would have come in under pressure with no air assist. And they, they supply you with this bottom unit right here and an elbow that comes out through your blast tube. That's where your oil comes in and that was attached right here to my T, if you remember from earlier. So this system creates a really nice atomization. And of course, air is coming around the whole outside of this unit and blowing into the blast tube and being mixed by that forward piece right there. Um, and then the, all the magic is happening right here in the nozzle. Uh, another thing to note real quickly is, is you want to make sure you have your air gap correct here. And then you want these really nice and solid so they don't move. That's what had happened to me. This had broken right here. And so I have tied it. And you ask, well, why would you run zip ties? Would that be safe? Would that not melt? Actually, they don't melt. Um, these ones have been here for over three years plus when I set it up initially. Yes, of course, this gets hot, but it doesn't get hot enough to, to give them any trouble. If you want to do a more professional look, then you'd want to run some metal, but then it makes it more hard to service. Um, I had just temp changed out the thermocoupler in this video, before this video, and having these zip ties made it much easier. So anyway, the other, uh, with back to the, the igniters, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, electrode tips. Other thing you want to pay attention to is the gap between the nozzle and here, the gaps between the two. There are specifications given by Beckett and also given by, uh, I think, CK Burners. you got to also watch that those are coming out here by this nozzle. You want that nozzle itself, I'm sorry, by this hole here in the uh, deflector. You want to make sure that two things happen, that the gap between here and your probe is not too short, that it wants to short against this instead of jumping the gap. You also want to make sure that your nozzle is sitting, your nozzle assembly right here, is sitting at the correct depth. You don't want it too far out. You don't want it too far in. 
Now there's some give and take. You could go a little out of spec and be actually fine. But if it's too far out, you won't get that great mixing, that Venturi effect. If you go too far in, you'll actually be spraying oil, an oil pattern against the outside of this, get a lot of carbon buildup. You also will get some of that oil that trickles, tries to trickle back through the blast tube. Uh, so anyway, there's just a quick synopsis of what, where that is, and hopefully here in a minute we will get to installing this in the burner assembly and show you how it all works together. Okay, so we are now back to completed product, final assembly. The unit uh, as it is running every day, basically. The only difference is the... Uh, I just pre-fired it just to make sure everything was okay before I started the video. And the uh, furnace blower hasn't kicked on yet, which it probably will at some point in this video. Uh, but the actual air, the igniter head, all of that is running. So I'm going to run down a quick synopsis of the system. Oh, there was the blower right there. Quick synopsis of the system and how it works. Uh, this was explained in the other video, but I'm going to do it again quickly because probably new people are going to be viewing this video um, so again fuel oil furnace old fuel oil furnace is what it what it is what it was um, I'm not sure exactly how old it is probably I think we estimate maybe the 80s late or early 80s had a Beckett pump in it air burner um, but it didn't come with anything except it was just the case so you would have had your air intake down here, and you would have had your exhaust up there for your hot air, and then, of course, your uh, spent fuel stack right there. Um, it came a little rough. I did paint it. Um, I did do some other cleaning on it, but nothing super major. Um, but starting over here in the corner, explaining kind of how the system works, is right there is an ammo can, an ammunition can. It's a 30 caliber ammunition can. Reason for that is twofold. First of all, the oil is coming in through here, and I'll show you the storage tanks in a bit. It's all gravity fed, no pumps or anything like that. There's a shutoff valve. Of course, it's off right now because we're not going to be running this long enough to need it. There's a pre filter, or I should say the main filter. There is a magnet underneath. Uh, just to help trap anything that may get in that filter, any metal particles. Pump some hold in there. The ammo can is what it's designed to do is preheat the oil. So I obviously come into a cold shop. This shop is not heated 24/7. I will come in the morning and it's cold in here, and the oil outside is obviously ambient temperature as well. So what this does is it has a water heater element inside it. You can't see the element, but you can certainly see the back of it right there. Uh, it's just a short water heater element, 110 volt. It has a regular water heater thermostat right there. Now, normally that's in a closed box. Uh, I'm actually getting ready to change this up so it's exposed now. You obviously wouldn't want that exposed if you're running all the time, but it was in a, uh, a regular household uh, wiring box to keep everything safe. Uh, but that would that's that's heating it to approximately 120, 130 degrees, just enough to warm it up, thin it out, and it also helps to separate any of the oil. Uh, water that finds its way in there. Then it obviously will come out and into the burner and I'll open this up and kind of show you it's just a brass float. It's literally a toilet bowl float and then there's a valve at the back there that you can get at a hardware store. It's specifically designed pretty much as a float valve. Uh, nothing special. But again all gravity fed. Oil comes into here. Obviously it's heat it up and then you can see some of the scum attaches on the top of the lid. You can just scrape it off the lid or wipe it off at any time. But that's part of the reason why I heat it and also part of the reason is to allow for um, impurities to find their way out. So uh, again, oil comes from here into the burner and, and we'll open that up and explain it. It loops, excess loops back through here and into the tank and starts the whole process over again. I was asked why do you, why an ammo can. I'll tell you two reasons. First of all, it's easy to get a hold of. They're built very well. And it's also kind of a safety thing. They've got a nice seal around the edge there. Um, I did have to vent it, just a small vent right here, because otherwise you will pull a vacuum on it and your, your system will quit working. Um, 
but now it, now when you redesign, this isn't going to occur. But in this design, you could dry fire the element. What that means is is that if some reason your your flow stopped, like in this case, if you didn't turn that valve on, or what was happening to me was um, the oil was so cold and the filter started to get a little clogged, it didn't feed enough oil in here. So that exposes your element inside there, exposes your element to atmosphere, and that element can overheat. And that, when that occurs, you could get a flash off. So in other words, the fumes that are in there could flash. Well, that did happen once, and that's the reason why there's a slight bend right here. Essentially, you get a small explosion inside of there, but because the ammo can is completely secured, all it did was just dent that. Um, made a nice puff of smoke out of the little vent tube, scared the crap out of me, obviously, but uh, nothing was damaged. The redesign is going to set the pickup because it'll be a deeper ammo can. The pickup higher, which was hard to do in this system, the float higher, and the element beyond the, uh, the pickup. So in other words, this would suck air. It would basically starve the unit for, for fuel. It would end up not being able to get to a point where the element was exposed before it ran out of fuel to burn. So that way it could never become exposed. This would never occur again. That's a redesign that's gonna happen in the second one. If you were doing a siphon style, uh, it wouldn't matter to you. Um, and, and, or if this can was somewhere else or if you didn't even heat it, which you do not have to, but it's highly designed, you wouldn't run into this problem. But it was something that I discovered um, probably about two years into this build. It happened to me one time and um, we're gonna make a design change probably this year. The other thing is, is your compressed air. So your compressed air comes in to just a regular, simple regulator, your choice, any style. I just have a standard one here. Comes into the pipe and again down into the unit. Now, when we open the door here, we'll explain all that. Uh, the final thing to show you before we get inside of the, is, is, the, is the air filter itself. I point that out because um, not many people need that. Um, but I, and again, in this old shop, it gets dirty pretty quick. How's my air compressor coming on? Uh, but I have chosen to put one on here and it's just the real cheap jobs so I can change them out very often. If I ever paint in here, which I'm not a painter, but I do paint engine parts, things of that nature, frames, thing, it'll catch those. It also keeps the dirt from getting into the squirrel cage, onto the motor, windings, any of that kind of stuff in the actual burners, uh, burner assembly. So I would advise it. If you did buy something like this, or you have maybe even a wood burner that you've converted, if it's forcing air into your building, filter it. Uh, last thing to show you is that uh, on the ammo can, I did put several service valves. So I've got a ball valve right here to drain the tank for service. I also have a ball valve here on the feet coming in, again, to isolate the tank and to isolate the pump. So if you ever go to service the pump, you can shut fuel off here and you can shut it off back there. This is isolated and the whole burner assembly is isolated. It's great for service. Okay, so let's go inside here and take a look around. In the earlier video, in the earlier portion of the video, you obviously saw the entire assembly apart. This is how it sits in the unit and how it operates. So what you're looking at, standard Beckett pump, to point out the components, obviously that is your transformer, that is your um, safety mechanism, it's also where your uh, thermostat would come in. This is what's looking for flame, if it doesn't see flame, it shuts the unit down after so many seconds. That is currently disabled, partially disabled, the sensor is here, but it's not in the blast tube. I should rephrase that, there is one in the blast tube, but I'm not using it. And the reason is, is because I can do a lot of different things with this system, to prime it, to do other uh, to basically allow, allow it to purge air or to kind of change my flame throw. And I was finding that if I had a, a sensor in there, it was shutting it off too early. Well, I would run a really small, small flame for little output. It couldn't see that flame and it would shut it down. So right now the sensor sits up here, seeing daylight all the time with the ability to shut it off if you need to. And that's eventually gonna get moved into the, the, the blast tube and yet again, another redesign. Um, I'll explain that a little bit later, but continuing on with the rest of how this system works, obviously we, here's your fuel coming in, it's coming in to copper, transfers to copper, 
goes into your standard Beckett pump, which is right here. This is what uh, your almost every Beckett is going to have, or any similar design. There is a pre-screen in here. There's a very fine screen in here. It's not really a filter, but it is a good screen. Uh, this is your pump, uh, the pressure adjustment. Not really needed for us. This is your uh, bleed screw, so if you want to bleed in here. And then again, this ring we spoke of a little earlier. This is where you set your airflow into the actual head of the burner, not the uh, nozzle, but going around the nozzle. <coughs> so uh, we showed earlier the, the pressure coming out of the pump. It's gone to here. It's gone down into the um, nozzle itself, which was in the blast tube. Here's your adjusting valve, which I will show how that working here very shortly to adjust your flame. It's basically just allowing or disallowing fuel into the, the burner head. You can set the pressure here. Then excess will return back to the holding tank. Um, the other thing is to show, I just have a simple switch so I can just turn everything off right here. Um, and then the actual controller, which is that's the back side of it. Here's the front side. When you get this from CK Burner, CK Burners, everything's already preset. Um, but this is adjustable. If you look up the, uh, I think this is, uh, I can't remember who makes it, but you can change your set points. So this is your set point. It's target is 180 degrees. This is actual red temperature at the nozzle head. Uh, that's how hot the oil is at the nozzle head. It has a thermocoupler, which we spoke of a little earlier, that right at the nozzle head, that's where it's reading is coming out. You can adjust this up and down. You can adjust the set point when the, when the element turns on, when the element turns off. It has an algorithm built into it, so it basically will keep it pretty much right there all the time. The only way it generally will go above that is if you are overheating. If you're running a really hot flame, you might start to heat the nozzle up beyond uh, the normal set point. And if you hit it with some cold oils, all of a sudden it may also drop below. But generally, the algorithm figures it out pretty quick, keeps you right there at that set temperature. So back into here, um, we spoke of the difference between siphon and pressure. In a siphon setup, which is what the CK burners is designed to do, you would have your source of oil, whether that's a can or whatever, that has to be lower than the center point of your nozzle. And it uh, will need to be heated almost always, or at least be at a set ambient temperature. Uh, the other thing is it's going to have a set flame. So the, the rate, whatever head, head you bought, is going to have a set amount of pressure, or, or I'm sorry, a set amount of flame BTUs. So in other words, if you get a 0.65 per gallon uh, per hour gallon or uh, one gallon per hour or whatever you have, that's all you get. And actually, you can only go down from there. If you had thicker oil or higher viscosity oils or uh, you know thicker in terms of because it was cold, your flame rate is going to drop. You can overcome some of that by upping your, your air pressure, but it can still only go so far. This system I like because you can really put your ammo can anywhere you want. It can be higher or lower, doesn't matter. Um, and you're preheating it again, so it doesn't really matter what's coming in. And the biggest advantage is it's doing two things. It's keeping everything in a loop, so it's filtering it, and it's keeping it good and good and good and warm. And you can do this valve right here where you can set your flame rate. So I'll need to grab a, I think I'm gonna need to grab a rag. Because this, burner gets kind of hot but if I come and show you the flame inspection port
can't do that with a siphon system, and you can't do that in, in, a, in a typical setup. You certainly can't do that with one of those pre-bought units that you get uh, from I don't know, Northern Jewel or any of those kind of places. Um, you also have full control of your air, so if you're having an atomization issue, if you're having uh, some ha uh, thicker oils, something that has got quite a bit of viscosity or just giving you any kind of troubles, you can adjust all of these things. A little more complicated for just a simple set and forget kind of guy if you want to just turn this thing on in the morning and forget about it. You will probably want to go with the standard system that has siphoned, because once you figure that out, you're done. You don't have to worry about anything. But I like this because, again, I come into a cold garage. I come into a shop that's, that's whatever the temperature is outside. So if it's 10 degrees, if it's 35 degrees, whatever, negative temperatures, I can go from cranking out the heat and backing away off. The other thing is that this system, once I turn it on, it stays on all day. I just adjust the flame. Don't have to mess with anything else. And I prefer it that way because with that style, um, I don't have to worry about any of the ons and the offs. I don't have to worry about, like, particularly right now, this igniter is not working. Um, <clears throat> this It's original igniter from the earlier model, so it's probably you know, 30 plus years old, and it finally burned out on me. So that flame is actually still going on its own heat. I just set a small uh, a small bit of uh, carburetor cleaner inside here to get a pre-flame going, and then once this oil hits that flame, it stays lit. So there's no actual arcing head of the nozzle right now. Now, if it shuts off, or if I shut it off, I'd have to restart it the same way. I'd have to, I'd have to do a pre-flame. It wouldn't self-ignite, but I don't need that because it's running all day. Um, in your systems, your setup, if you had it thermostatically controlled, you'd have a thermostat that would attach to this box. You'd have your flame sensor that would make sure and verify it did light, and of course your igniter would, would function correctly, and then it would turn on and it would turn off every day, just as you need. It would also have, we spoke of earlier, the air solenoid. The air solenoid would stop if this tripped because the thermostat uh, didn't call for heat or if the flame went out, like you ran out of fuel or something didn't ignite, all that would shut down, which is great safety measures. I highly recommend that if you're gonna run it, but not needed for my setup. Uh, another thing to add, help answer some of the questions I've been asked, what kind of oil, what, what, is, what, what is the waste oil, where is it coming from? Well, basically it's coming from oil changes. I do service work in here. I'll just kind of give you a quick tour of the shop. Um, I am a small repair business. This is about a 36 by 36 building with a, almost a 14 foot ceiling and it's uninsulated. So it's got block walls, no insulation up there, but it works for me. But in this system, or I'm sorry, in this, in this building, um, I essentially, I'm not paying for my heat because this burner is running the oil changes or any service work I do, uh, I do transmission services or trans, uh, power steering or transfer case or anything like that, any fluid of oil based that comes out of a car or a vehicle or other, um, that's my heat. Um, will not do vegetable oil. I'm sure there are ways, but uh, I was asked about vegetable oil. No, not really, won't do that. I suppose if you could thin it out enough and uh, keep it warm maybe, but most vegetable oil is coming pretty dirty and it will it will uh, solidify when it gets cold. <clears throat> Not gonna work in this kind of scenario. Um, again, also about the adjustment, because of the size of the building and being uninsulated, I have the ability to heat this up really fast or slow, depending on what I need to do. And I think that adjustment is far superior to a standard system, which gives you one set rate and that's all you get. Um, I'll take you outside real quick to note what's going on there. So as we pointed out, the oil comes in there. We'll show that outside. There are four tanks. Um, in this particular case, I nowadays typically only use this one because I'm not here as often as I used to be, but this uh, tank, obviously I just dump the oil in up the top and then I have a trap system here. So if I do have any oil or heavy, heavy, I'm sorry, water or heavy sludge, I can drain it out right there at the bottom and then it will come in and go into the shop. 
You do run into an issue in some cases with those further tanks. The oil gets a little heavy in those lines. But if you had a pump system or you had some kind of a method to uh, keep your oil moving, keep your oil under pressure, then you wouldn't have that problem. I don't have that problem here because that first tank and even the second tank, if they're full or even half full, there's plenty of gravity <clears throat> and they will come in here. And only the only disadvantage is, is if it's really cold and you do need to get some impurities, you will need to change this filter often. But I went with a standard filter, easy to get hold of, they're only a few bucks a piece and they're real thick. So it works very, very well. So again, hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully I explained everything a little bit better this time. Maybe it makes more sense than the previous video. Um, I am logged into my account so I can watch comments as well. We didn't have that initially. I had some people comment and it was, uh, I didn't realize that their comments had been up there three, four months, even a year. I did respond to them, but uh, I only heard back from, I think one. So uh, I do apologize for that. This from here forward, um, I shouldn't get notifications on my phone and we should be able to answer any questions should you have them. Hopefully more videos to come. I, I hope to make a few videos on this project here. This is this uh, F-350 truck that we're working on. Um, and maybe show some of the, the other fun stuff that we do in the shop here occasionally. Again, thank you for looking, for viewing, and have a good day.